the grouchy nerd. All right, you antisocial weirdos, it's time to learn a game that can play at the ideal player count. One. Hadrian's Wall, designed by Bobby Hill and published by Renegade Game Studios, is a flip and write, which is very much like a roll and write, except instead of rolling dice and then marking up a piece of paper, you're going to be drawing cards from a deck and then marking up a piece of paper. It's kind of like Yahtzee, but with entirely different rules and mechanisms. I don't think we thought that one through. This one finds you as a Roman general tasked with guarding one of the 16 forts along the wall that made the border of the Roman Empire at its height in the area now known as England from the onslaught of the Picts, which were sort of proto-Scots. They were the people living in Scotland before Scotland was Scotland. Romans lost, by the way. Scotland, or the area now known as Scotland, never fell to the Romans. But you're going to do great. There's also a link in the description to a video that has more information about the wall and its significance by a cool Scottish dude with whom I have absolutely no affiliation. I just thought the video was cool. The game is played over six rounds, each representing one year, and your goal in Hadrian's Wall is to get as many victory points as possible. Though the Renegade Games website does have a printable solo campaign that offers different challenges over 16 games, one for each fort in the wall, and they are hard. Though, as I understand it, future printings will include the campaign in the rulebook, so you might not have to go seek it out, but if you have an older one, it's there on the website, and I'm going to put it in the description as well. Each round, you'll gain workers and resources, which you'll spend to take actions around the board, often allowing you to take more actions. Your turn ends when there are no more actions you can take, and then you'll fend off the picks, who, very luckily, only attack once per year and only when you're good and ready for them. So polite. How did the Romans lose? Take both sides of one player board and align them side by side to form your board. Take one each of both game sheets and place them side by side and grab a pen or a pencil or a marker or a real tiny stamp, maybe. Shuffle the fate cards and place them face down in your play area. Gather the soldiers, builders, servants, civilians, and resources and place them nearby. Though playing solo, it's unlikely that you'll need more than five or six of each worker type and maybe eight resources if you're looking to cut down on table clutter. Shuffle one color's 12 player cards for yourself and shuffle and place another color set nearby. Your player cards can be used in two ways, for the goal in the top half or to use during your turn on the bottom half, both of which we'll talk more about later. The left game sheet shows the section of the wall with which you have been tasked to guard and is made up of several tracks as well as a few buildings. Tracks are made of boxes and are always filled left to right. Any white space is a box regardless of shape. The more you develop your fort track and increase your infrastructure, noted on these flags, you'll unlock the ability to build buildings. Buildings must be completed in size order, that is, you must build the small hotel before you build the large hotel. The right sheet represents the city that has grown around the fort and is broken into five aspects of Roman society. Traders, performers, priests, apparitories, and patricians. The buildings in each section have a requirement similar to the infrastructure level of the fort, but instead, you must have filled that many boxes along the associated citizen track. So you can't build the small precinct until you filled the third box on the trader's track. Buildings on the right side must also be built in order from small to large. Anytime you fill in a blank box, that's it, action's over. But if you fill in a box with one or more icons, you'll gain the benefits indicated by those icons. In some cases, that will mean immediately filling another box. Other times, you'll get a worker or a resource, thus continuing your turn. Some tracks may only be filled as rewards for filling in boxes on other tracks. For instance, back on the left sheet, these four attributes tracks. Renown, Piety, Valor, and Discipline. Boxes in these tracks can't be filled directly but are gained all over the board, and each filled box in each row is a point at the end of the game. Each turn plays thusly. Draw the top fate card and take all of the workers and any resources pictured and place them on your player board. Next, draw the top two player cards of your deck. Choose one as a path card, which gives you a goal and possible points to gain at the end of the game, depending on how well you accomplished that goal. The other card is this turn's prospect card. Gain any further workers and or resources pictured here. Next, gain resources equal to the filled boxes on your resource production track. You begin the game with one. Then gain civilians equal to the filled boxes in your hotels, builders equal to the filled boxes in your workshops, and fill attribute boxes of your choice equal to your filled road boxes. Now these are all at zero right now, but remember every worker is another action and every box filled in those attribute tracks are a point at the end of the game, so you should make those be not zero pretty quick. 
Then draw two cards from the neutral deck. Take actions around the board, usually by spending the worker type and or resources pictured by each track or building. So you might spend a servant to fill a box in the mining and foresting track. Some boxes in this track will give you immediate resources to use and allow you to fill a box on your resource production track, getting you an additional resource each subsequent round. Soldiers, or filling in boxes with a sword icon, will allow you to fill a box on your wall guard. Some boxes on this track will grant you discipline. Other boxes will let you fill in a box in one of your three cohorts. Cohorts are your main defense against the Picts, which we'll talk about when they attack. Each cohort track is independent. When you fill a box with the cohort icon, you may only fill one box on one cohort track. Spend a resource to advance either the sippy or wall track, though do note that the chained section of fort must be developed first. So you can't fill this box on the wall track until you've filled this box on the fort track. Though the sippy and wall develop independently, you may develop the sippy past the wall and vice versa. Boxes in these tracks may also grant cohort boxes as well as renown and civilians. Develop sections of the fort by spending workers or soldiers. Boxes on this track may give you cohorts, or civilians, or discipline. Filling a box with an orange flag hanging from it will also increase your fort's infrastructure level to that number. At first, you may only develop any of these tracks in the first column, as you only have a small granary to begin with. Buildings each have a cost in workers and or resources, as well as an infrastructure requirement. So to build a medium granary, you must have at least an infrastructure level of one, and spend one servant, one builder, and one resource, then fill in this box. Once the medium granary is built, you may develop your tracks into the center column. And likewise, the large granary, which requires an infrastructure level of 5, will allow development of the last column. Anytime you fill a box that's connected to another box with a plus sign, you're going to fill both of those boxes. Icons in the same box separated by a slash, like the one you'll fill when you build either the small or large road, mean you're going to choose between the two rewards. Training Grounds allows you to spend one builder to gain a sword icon, which can be used to fill wall guard boxes, though you may only use the Training Grounds once per round. Any action that may only happen once per round will have an attached box with a number sign, or a pound sign, or I guess depending on your age, a hashtag. Record the round in which you used this action here. The forum allows you to exchange any two workers for a worker type of your choice. Though this, like the training grounds, may only be used once per round. It's also a bummer. Just feels like you definitely did something wrong if you're trading two workers for one worker, but I guess if you need it, it's better to have it than not. But, ugh, doesn't feel good. When you've reached the 15th box on any attribute track, you'll gain the ability to build that attribute's associated landmark by spending a builder and two resources. You'll gain two boxes on another attribute track. Spend civilians to fill boxes in citizen tracks. Similar to the fort's infrastructure, buildings in each area have a required box that must have been filled along its associated citizen track. For instance, once you've reached boxes 3, 6, and 9 of the trader's track, you may build small, medium, and large precincts, respectively gaining each of the indicated benefits. Once you've filled the fourth trader's box, you may build the market. Once you've built the market, you may spend a resource to purchase one trade good, which look like this. Trade goods may be found on the fate cards or on either card from the neutral deck. Your goal in the market is to have as many different numbered trade goods as possible, so your first three unique numbers will each get you one renown. Unique numbers four and five will get you two renown each, and the sixth unique trade good number will get you three renown. So that's potentially 10 points right there, even more if you chose the merchant path card as one of your path cards. To purchase a trade good, you must first have filled the number of boxes on the trader track shown here. Spend one resource to write the number of that good in the box. If you use the trade good on your card, the resource you pay goes back into the supply. If you use one of the neutral cards, place that resource on the neutral card. That'll come up later. You may also use a fate card for its good, but not the one you can see. You'll pay the resource to the supply, then flip over a new fate card and use that good number, and just hope it's not one you already have. The first flag on the performer's track lets you build a theater. Once the theater is built, you may pay a resource to order a performance, granting you an attribute and either a worker or an icon that you may spend on another citizen track. You may order only one performance per round, but you don't have to take them in order. You do, however, have to have reached the indicated flag number along the performer's track. Once you've filled the third box in the performer's track, 
attack, you may build the Ludus Gladiatorius. Once built, you may spend a servant or civilian to train one of your gladiators. Circle the leftmost available box on one of the gladiator's tracks, but note that each box has a flag indicating how far you must be along the performer's track. Each box circled this way is that gladiator's strength. Once your gladiators have had a chance to build up some strength, you may have them compete in battle. Choose one of your gladiators to battle, then flip the top card of the fate deck. The number here is how much damage that gladiator will take, one, two, or three. Fill in that many of the circled boxes. If you run out of circles to fill, do not mark any more boxes on that track. That gladiator has died in battle, and you'll receive any piety marked here below their final strength. That gladiator can no longer train or battle because you sent them to their death for your own entertainment. You sicko! However, if there are still any unfilled but circled boxes, that gladiator has won its battle and will get renown or possibly resources, again marked below their strength. You may train the gladiators as many times as you have servants or civilians to spend, but you can only send them each to battle once per round, again keeping track of which round you use them here. Advancing the priest's track will allow you to build gardens and temples. The small and large gardens get you a bit of piety and allow you to advance other citizen tracks. Temples, of course, must be built in order, small, then medium, then large. Once built, spend a worker of any type to fill in a box. Boxes must be filled left to right, top to bottom, so you'll receive a piety as a benefit every second box that you fill in. You must fill each box in the small temple before you can begin filling boxes in the medium, and likewise the medium must be filled filled before you can start filling in the large. And of course, you must have filled the box on the priest track indicated by the flag next to this action. When you fill in the last box in each temple, you'll also receive a favor, which we're going to come back to, but for right now, just circle the box with the favor icon. Once you've filled the third box on the apparitories track, you can build the baths to remove disdain from among your citizens. You gain disdain when your fort takes damage during the Pictish attack. It feels like I'm saying a slur. Picked. Picked. Just feels like something you shouldn't say if you're not from there. When you gain disdain, you'll circle one of these boxes. Twice per round, you may spend the indicated number of resources to fill in one disdain, thus removing it. Disdain will count against your score at the end of the game. Reaching the fourth box on the Apparatories track unlocks the Courthouse. Once built, the Courthouse has three columns, each with different benefits. The first column allows you to take a servant for free, the second column to exchange a builder for two servants, and the third to exchange one servant for a builder. It's best that you not dwell on exactly what's going on if you go to the Courthouse and come back with a servant. You may activate more than one column per round, but each column can only be used once per round, keeping track next to the box you filled. The first, third, and sixth boxes on the Patrician's track will allow you to recruit diplomats. Each will cost a soldier, a servant, and two resources, and give back a valor and two favors, and each will serve one of your cohorts. Indicate which cohort that diplomat will serve by filling in this arrow. We're going to go over these more when we get to the attack part, but each favor can basically negate an attack, thereby sparing you a disdain. Spend a soldier to scout. Fill in one of these horsey boxes, making sure to note the patrician track requirements, and add the scout pattern on your card or from one of the neutral cards to the 4x5 grid here. The entire pattern must fit, and you cannot go over already filled in boxes. Anytime you fill a box with an icon, gain that icon's reward as normal. Additionally, gain one valor for each completed row. And you may use the same pattern on the same card multiple times in one turn, so long as you have the soldiers to spend on it. If you use the pattern on your prospect card, the soldier goes back to the supply. If you used one of the neutral cards, the soldier will be placed on that card. When there are no more actions you can take, move on to the end of the year. If you have any remaining workers or resources, they're returned to the main supply. Next, the picks attack. The game board will tell you how many picks attack, depending on your difficulty level. Green is easy, yellow is normal, and red is hard. For your first game or two, go ahead and use the easy number, but do note that that solo campaign I mentioned earlier does assume you're playing on normal difficulty. 
Draw the number of cards indicated from the Fate deck, but deal one more card for each resource or soldier on a neutral card, then return those to the supply. Reveal each Fate card, but you're only looking at the very top of the card. The picks will attack to the left, right, or middle. Your cohorts, left, right, and middle, will defend those attacks. For each arrow revealed, you need an equal or greater number of filled boxes on the cohort in that position. If your cohorts block all damage, gain valor equal to the number in this flag, though you gain disdain for any attacks that break through your defenses. Disdain is tracked here by circling the boxes, one for each successful attack. If you did manage to fend off most of the attacks, but you still did take some disdain, you're going to gain gain valor equal to the number in the flag minus the amount of disdain you took. However, favors will allow you to ignore an attack card. Fill in the favor to show you've used it. Favors from temples can be used to ignore any attack card, but remember that diplomats have to serve one cohort. So the attack card those favors ignore must have been against the cohort in that position. Also, remember that your baths can remove disdain by filling in those circles. When you gain valor from defending attacks, you may gain a soldier. This soldier goes into your pool for the next round. Begin the next round by drawing a new fate card, drawing and choosing a new path card and prospect cards, as well as two new cards from the neutral deck. Gain workers and resources on the fate card, your prospect card, resource track, hotel, and workshop. Play continues in this way until the sixth year ends. Resolve the picked attack as normal. Though if you were to gain a soldier from the valor track in this final attack, you don't get that soldier. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. You're you're done. Game's over. Count up your points from each attribute track, as well as points from your path cards. Subtract the number of points below your final disdain. Remember that filled in disdain is removed and not counted. Then check your final score to see if you're a Spider-Man, a Centaur, Pontius Pilate, a Castrated Prefect, or a Legion of Legolases. You check those? Those are right? Cool. And that's how to play Hadrian's Wall. Now get off my sippy. What the hell's a sippy? The Grouchy Nerd. I know I'm technically of Scottish descent, but I, I love the Roman energy here. You're going to build a wall rather than interact with your neighbors? It's brilliant.